Let's look at the five causes of anxiety and talk about how to address anxiety depending on the cause. The latest WHO report estimates that roughly 300 million people have a current anxiety disorder. And in my line of work as a psychologist, anxiety issues are one of the most common problems that people come to me with. And while every human being in their life experiences some anxiety, anxiety disorders can be crippling. They can interfere with work, relationships, and life in general and if left untreated often lead to or exacerbate mood disorders like depression. So we're going to talk about five different causes of anxiety and illustrate different ways of dealing with anxiety using examples. These five causes of anxiety are based on what I've seen from my experience working with clients as well as the training and education that I've received. And if you're watching this video with a specific person in mind, maybe yourself, keep an ear out and see if you can link any of these causes together to see if maybe multiple ones are present at the same time. So let's jump into the five causes of anxiety and how to deal with them. Meet Chris. Chris has been given a task to give a PowerPoint presentation in front of his group of peers. Since being given this task, Chris has been constantly anxious. He's worried that it's gonna go poorly and he's really worried that he's gonna have an anxious meltdown in front of his peers and embarrass himself. So when I see this problem, question number one for me is, does Chris actually know how to give a PowerPoint presentation? To which Chris would respond, I've literally never opened PowerPoint before in my life. The problem isn't that Chris has anxiety for no reason. The problem is that Chris is now facing a problem that he does not have the skills to overcome. No amount of calming skills, no amount of cognitive therapy, no amount of relaxation is going to help him to remove his anxiety. And no amount of those things should help him to resolve his anxiety. Ideally, anxiety is a driving force. It's pushing you to resolve a problem and get prepared to resolve a problem before it occurs. And in Chris's case, he shouldn't be shutting down his anxiety. He should be using his anxious energy as fuel to learn the skills he needs to learn before this presentation occurs. But unfortunately for Chris, it's actually a little bit more complicated for him. Because even if Chris learned the skills he needed, Chris himself would still be anxious because Chris has an underlying emotional anxiety problem. And that takes us to the second part of the skill issue for Chris, which is he's missing the fundamental skill of distress tolerance. His whole life, Chris has done a really good job of avoiding any situation that made him feel really uncomfortable and stressed out. And so because of this, Chris has never developed the capacity to actually be in a distressing and stressful situation and tolerate it. So even if Chris had the skills to do a PowerPoint presentation, if he didn't also have the distress tolerance skills to tolerate the innately uncomfortable and stressful situation that he would be in giving a presentation in front of people, it's still gonna fall apart. So the solution to skill issue based anxiety is to build the skills that you need first. Whether that's technical skills like in Chris's case with PowerPoint, whether that's parenting skills, or whether it's more mental skills like assertiveness skills or calming skills or distress tolerance skills or basic communication, things like how to handle a negotiation, how to handle a conflict, how to handle a job interview. Until the skills are built, no amount of relaxation skills, no amount of positive self-talk is going to alleviate the anxiety. So Chris solved his problem by A, studying online about PowerPoint presentations and learning and practicing. And Chris also practiced building his ability to tolerate distress. There were a few different ways that Chris could have done this, but for him what worked was detached mindfulness. This was a skill that he practiced by going into slightly stressful situations and just observing his thoughts and his emotions without judgment he simply observed and accepted and learned to tolerate these feelings and these thoughts. And so while solving skills is often part one and goes a really long way, there are other obstacles or other causes of anxiety that can be present in a person's life beyond simple skill issues. Cause of anxiety number two, underlying trauma. Meet Jackie. A few years ago, Jackie had a brutal car accident. On a normal day, as they were just walking down the sidewalk, a bright red sports car veered off the road smashed into the sidewalk and almost squashed them. During this event, very understandably, Jackie flew into a panic. They were hyperventilating and it took them a long time to calm down. Now in Jackie's present day life, whenever they see a bright red sports car or they hear the screeching of tires, this reactivates this traumatic memory and causes them to have a large anxiety attack. And we could talk about other examples here too. We could replace Jackie's car trauma with any other type of traumatic incident. Whether that was verbal abuse by parents, which may lead to being yelled at in the present day as a trigger for anxiety. Or a memory of being attacked by a large man, leading to seeing large men in the present day being a trigger for anxiety. The specifics of a trauma can change depending on a person in their life and their experience, but what really matters is that a trauma occurred in the past and it is now unresolved. This traumatic memory can now be reactivated in the present day, and the reactivation of this traumatic memory is leading to large anxiety in the present. So Jackie's resolution to unresolved trauma being the cause of her present day anxiety 
was to resolve this trauma. Through engaging in trauma-focused therapy and engaging in different parts of it, such as exposure work and changing their underlying thoughts in relation to the trauma, their beliefs and projections on the present day and the future that came out of the trauma, through a combination of all of these things, they were able to resolve this unresolved event. Jackie was able to make it that they were no longer anxious when they heard the screeching of tires. Jackie was able to make it that they could see a red sports car and this didn't trigger any traumatic memories. But Jackie also noticed that there were times where they didn't see a red car or they didn't hear screeching tires but their anxiety would still flare up. So they needed to investigate what was causing this. Cause number three. These are known as cognitive distortions, also known as thinking traps, also sometimes called negative thought patterns. They go by a lot of different names. I'm going to be using cognitive distortions because it's the one that makes the most sense to me. In cognitive therapy, there are ways of thinking that are known as cognitive distortions. These are ways of thinking that are both exaggerated or irrational and lead to suffering in our present day lives. Cognitive distortions are typically present across a wide range of psychological issues. But when it comes to anxiety, there are four main types of cognitive distortions that I've noticed in my clients again and again. And similarly to what I said before, where all humans sometimes will feel some anxiety, all humans sometimes will have illogical and irrational thoughts. So as you listen to these examples, have a think about and apply it to yourself and ask, which of these irrational thought patterns does my brain sometimes use? Then once we get through all of the examples, I'll talk about the two main solutions to these cognitive distortions. Here's the first example. Jackie received an email from her supervisor that was slightly critical of her work. Instead of taking the critique in stride or reaching out to discuss it with her supervisor, Jackie immediately began to panic. They worried that they were going to get fired. They worried that they wouldn't be able to pay their bills. They worried that they were going to become homeless. They were worried that all these things would fall in step and their entire life would fall apart. This line of thinking is catastrophizing, a series of thoughts and predictions about the future that are greatly negatively exaggerated. It's a line of thought where your brain takes one event that could be interpreted negatively and blows it up to the negative extreme. It predicts catastrophe. That's why it's called catastrophizing. We'll move on to the second cognitive distortion and it ties very well into the first one. See if you can spot how. Jackie sent a message to their friend a couple of days ago and now Jackie's friend hasn't responded for a few days. Instead of considering the various possibility for their friend's silence, such as perhaps they were busy, maybe they've lost their phone, maybe they're just taking a break from social media, or maybe they saw the message, planned to respond to it, but just forgot because life gets hectic sometimes. Now, instead of considering the various possibilities, Jackie immediately jumped to the conclusion that their friend is mad with them, that their friend hates them, that they want to cut off connection and have it all be done with. So Jackie started imagining scenarios in their head where they must have done something or said something to piss their friend off. And Jackie did this without any evidence or any consideration of possible explanations. This is the cognitive distortion known as jumping to conclusions, where you have one piece of information that you don't quite know the answer to. In this case, Jackie wondering, why is my friend not messaging me back? and you jump to an automatic conclusion without considering other possibilities and without looking for evidence to justify your conclusions. The third cognitive distortion ties into all of the other ones and makes them all significantly worse if it's present. This is the cognitive distortion known as magnification. Magnification is where you take a look at negative information and magnify it, make it bigger, make it seem more important. And at the same time, you take any positive information and you minimize it and you make it seem not important or trivial. And this over time leads to a very negative worldview because a person is constantly maximizing the negatives, minimizing the positives, and therefore they're going to use that information to then predict things in the future. So then they're going to predict that the future is going to be more negative and less positive. For example, whenever Jackie receives critique or criticism from people in their life, they magnify and they expand and they really focus on these critiques and criticisms. They treat them as extremely important. But then whenever they receive positive information, they dismiss it, they write it off, they say it's just an exception or they just don't even consider it. So over time, Jackie can only believe and only really sees the negative parts in their life and they can only really predict the negative outcomes in their life because they're only looking at and remembering and focusing on the negative information that comes their way. And typically, in order to not have a negative prediction and a negative worldview, you want to counteract this, right? You look at what's the evidence that things are going to go well, what's the evidence that things are going to go poorly, and you use the evidence from both sides to come to a good logical conclusion. But because of Jackie's magnification of the negative and minimization of the positive, 
they can only predict the negative. And speaking of predictions, this leads us to the fourth cognitive distortion that we'll talk about. Human intuition is a really powerful tool and it can often be really, really good. For example, when you meet a person for the first time or you go to a new place and you kind of feel the vibe, you feel the energy, you get a bit of an understanding of like, what is this like? Is it a safe place, a safe person? Do I just, something feels a little bit off. Our intuition, our gut instinct can sometimes be a really powerful tool. But there are times where our human intuition really sucks. And the biggest place where our intuition is just terrible and leads us astray is when it comes to percentages, odds, and probability. The probability of failing, the probability of catastrophe, the probability of winning the lottery. Our intuition and gut instinct both sucks at evaluating the odds and probabilities of these things and acting in accordance in a logical way that makes sense based on the odds and probability. Back to the endless anxious examples from the life of Jackie. Jackie wants to go swimming in the ocean, but they haven't gone there in years because they're terrified of a shark attack and getting eaten. Now when asked about this, Jackie would say, I know that it's not a great chance of happening. I know that it's really rare. It's probably like 1% probably even less than that, maybe it's half a percent. It's probably really, really low, but it still makes me scared. Well, to our mind, 1% sounds really low. Half a percent sounds even lower. 0.1 of a percent sounds so unlikely to happen that why would we worry about it at all? But yet, that's still a pretty high chance of getting mauled by a shark. And if I were to go swimming and someone told me there was a 1% chance or a 0.1% chance of getting mauled to death by a shark, I would never go to the ocean again either. The idea of doing that would make me really anxious. And the reason that Jackie can say these things is because their brain, just like many and most and almost all other human brains, are terrible at intuitively calculating probability and converting it into a percentage. Because the truth is, the odds of being attacked by a shark aren't 1%, which would be 1 in 100. They're not 1 in 1,000. They're not 1 in 100,000. They're not 1 in a million. The odds of a shark attack are 1 in about 35 million. And when we convert that into a percentage, it's approximately 1 in 0.0000002% chance of a shark attack. But the human brain is really bad at intuitively feeling what 0.0000002% feels like. Our brain gets 100%. Our brain gets 0%. Our brain and our intuitive gut feeling, it pretty well gets 50-50. Kind of gets these nice big rounded percentages. But our intuition does not grasp 0.0000002%. It does not grasp that, so it fits it into one of the other categories. Is it 0%? Well, our brain knows it's not zero, so it's not going to predict that. What's the next closest thing? Our brain kind of can grasp maybe 1%, so it slots it into that category. And now when Jackie is thinking about going swimming, it feels the probability of 1% of shark attack, and that feels horrifying. So this is the cognitive distortion of incorrect assessment of probability. And this cognitive distortion can be fed into by other cognitive distortions that we've talked about. Like for example, if Jessica in the past has heard about stories on the news of shark attacks, Jessica will maximize, magnify these stories so they stick in their mind. Or when Jackie is considering going swimming, their line of thought catastrophizes and it instantly goes to the worst possible place, which is, oh my God, I'm going to get ripped apart on the beach in front of all my friends and family and it's just gonna be traumatic for everybody. So what can Jackie do? It seems like they have a lot of different cognitive distortions creating a lot of problems in their life. The good news is there are straightforward solutions to each of these problems. The bad news is, is that straightforward doesn't necessarily mean easy. To resolve catastrophizing, Jackie would need to start by mapping out, perhaps with a list, all the times in their life where they engage in catastrophizing. So what Jackie started doing was writing down each time they got into a situation where they started having catastrophic thoughts. They would write down the situation that they were in, they would write down the catastrophic thoughts that they were having, and then they would also write down the opposite of that. They would write down what is the best possible way that this could go. Then when they had the absolute catastrophe and the absolute best, they would map out every other possible way that the event could go. Through mapping all of this out, they could then find the realistic middle ground of what was likely to happen, and then try to repeat and reinforce that to themselves, to train their brain to recognize and realize that, hey, there's more to these scenarios than just the bleak end and death. So whenever Jackie would get into a situation where they would typically catastrophize, they now have an understanding of all the different ways that it could go instead of just catastrophe. And by Jackie reminding themselves of all the different ways it could go, the positives included, their brain gradually learned that catastrophe isn't guaranteed. And over time, this changed their pattern of thinking and slowly helped to reduce their anxiety. 
To resolve jumping to conclusions, again, Jackie would write down the times where they jumped to conclusions. They would then visualize themselves in these same scenarios in the future. And in these visualized scenarios, they would practice taking a pause and considering what are the other possible explanations for what's happening. If their mind was automatically jumping to some negative conclusion, what would be the opposite of that negative conclusion? What else could explain what's going on? And how can I look for evidence that shows me the reality, that shows me the truth? When it came to magnification of the negative, Jackie needed to learn and practice to do the inverse. The goal here wasn't for Jackie to become a carefree, blinded optimist, but ideally Jackie wanted to learn to view the world in a balanced way. So because Jackie had spent so long and so much of their life just looking and focusing on the negatives, they needed to learn to look for and focus on the positives. And over time, by looking for and focusing on and spending time evaluating the positive feedback and the positive aspects of their life, this began to balance out the way that Jackie saw the world. It began to balance out the predictions that they had for the future. And when it came to their thoughts, their beliefs, their ways of thinking, this began to balance out from being incredibly negatively geared towards being more balanced, more realistic, and more helpful. And finally, when it came to misassessment of probability. With the other cognitive distortions mostly resolved, the misassessment of probability was creating less problems in Jackie's life than it was before. But they still needed to learn more about probabilities. And so they learned better how to properly evaluate the odds of things happening, what that was actually like as a percentage. And sure, learning this helped to reduce their anxiety to a degree. But what they really needed to do with that understanding was then to act in a way that made sense in accordance to the realistic probabilities of these events. Because then over time, if logically Jackie was coming to the conclusion that the odds of catastrophe and death and a shark attack were one in 32 million, they needed to act in a way that made sense according to that. They needed to get in that water, go for a swim and enjoy their life. And even if that made them feel anxious, over time their brain would learn to recognize that, hey, my assumption of probabilities is actually pretty accurate because I thought that I would get mauled to death but my logical mind told me it was really rare and now I'm swimming and it's not happening. So I guess my logical mind can be trusted. Well, the solution for each individual cognitive distortion seems straightforward. Actually simultaneously applying them all took serious practice, hard work, time, and more practice. And this is a point that I really just can't stress enough. When you're working on strategies to change your thoughts or to better your mental health or change the way you act in certain scenarios, if you don't practice the skills that you're gonna need, if you don't practice the new ways of thinking that you want to have before you need to use them, then when it comes time for you to use these new skills, when it comes time for you to use these new ways of thinking, you're not gonna be able to use them. Jackie practiced their new cognitive skills and their new ways of thinking many, many times before the situation would actually come up that they needed them. Jackie wanted to be well prepared so that when problems did arise, they knew that they had the prep work done to be able to handle it properly. And in the end, Jackie could enter situations with better mental preparation. They could properly evaluate the probability of events and act in accordance to that probability. And they could look at information in a balanced way weighing up both the positives and the negatives and looking for real evidence that backed up their beliefs. And with all of this hard work, Jackie's anxiety was mostly alleviated and was causing very few problems in their life and with their day-to-day -day enjoyment and satisfaction. But even with all of these in place, things can still go wrong. The lesson to learn really isn't that with prep work, nothing can go wrong. The real lesson is that if and when things do go wrong, you have the capability, you have the problem-solving capacity to handle, to create, and to implement solutions to overcome new problems. That's the real long-term solution to anxiety. But we still have two more parts to this video, two more causes of anxiety, so let's move on to those. A reality that exists is that some people are going to have large amounts of anxiety for no clear discernible reason. They haven't got a history of trauma, they evaluate their thoughts and they don't seem too illogical or too unhelpful. There's no current day massive amount of stress that's going on. There's no big stressors in their life. There's no clear discernible reason. And so while this is quiet rare, and I, I wanna emphasize, quiet rare, some people just have had a really unlucky genetic roll of the dice. And because of this unlucky roll of the dice, they're just going to be predisposed to have large amounts of anxiety at everyday problems that other people just really wouldn't have. And in some even rarer cases, due to physical brain damage, this same effect can be found. Treatment wise, many people that fall into this category long term will be on anxiolytic medication and sometimes this can be tapered off. But also many of the people in this situation with neurological damage or genetic predispositions to just constant chronic heightened anxiety 
they can still benefit from a large suite of behavioral protocols. All of the things that would help the normal person manage anxiety will still typically help. Having a really good, regimented, deep sleep schedule is fantastic. Managing their diet, managing their exercise, having good social support and social connection, all of these things go a really long way. So whilst for some people in this category, they will always have some degree of inherently unhelpful and over-exaggerated anxiety compared to the situations that they're facing, there are typically at the very least ways that they can slightly alleviate this or reduce the amount of distress that this causes them or the amount of impairment that it causes them in their life. Now we arrive at the final cause of anxiety. What diagnostically falls under the V codes in the DSM-5 this is what I call the everything is on fire and it's okay to be anxious category. So while everybody at some point in their life will have a time where things are just really falling apart, things on your end and on my end and on anyone else's end can still be handled a bit better and at the very least, even though this won't resolve the situation, it won't resolve the anxiety, it won't resolve the negative feelings, it would still be nice to bring down the anxiety, it would still be nice to bring down the negative feelings a little bit because less suffering is better than more suffering, even if you can't completely eliminate it. Even in situations where things are all on fire, you can learn to manage them and to manage your emotions a little bit better. This doesn't mean it's going to be sunshine and rainbows and butterflies, but if you can take a 10 out of 10 shitty situation and make it feel like a 7 out of 10 situation, isn't that an improvement that you'd want to take? So here are three general steps that you can implement during times of your life where things are really just falling apart on a grand scale. The first is to reflect upon the prior causes of anxiety and see if any of those are present that are making your anxiety even worse than it should be. Are there unresolved traumas? Are there cognitive distortions? Are there skills that you could build that would help you to handle the situation better and at the very least reduce a bit of that tension and anxiety? Second would be implementing general mental health strategies. Having really good sleep hygiene. Implementing calming skills regularly. Giving yourself time to process by going for walks or journaling where available. Depending on what the actual situation is, depending on what resources and how much time you actually have available, some of these general tips are going to be more or less even possible. But the ones that are possible, implementing them can help even if it's just a little bit. Third is to seek external support. A lot of the time, and a lot of us who are raised in the West, we're raised in a very independent, individualistic culture. And we can feel bad about reaching out to other people for reaching out for help. We don't want to feel like a burden on others. But life is hard, normally. And so when it gets catastrophic, you shouldn't be expecting yourself to have to handle it all alone. When things get really hard, that is where your friends and your family are meant to support you. That is where literal professionals like doctors, social workers, therapists and so on are meant to actually be there to help you. So if you have access to these supports, rely on them and don't hold yourself back from them. I want to close out by saying there's obviously more nuance to anxiety. And as you delve into the specifics of a person's life and situation, you begin to see way, way, way more detailed than what I could present in a general overview video. And to get a little bit more into the weeds, into specific topics such as social anxiety or such as separation or abandonment anxiety, I've got videos on those and I've got more coming. So if you want to see some more detailed videos on more nuanced topics, subscribe because they will be coming out in the future. Or if you have a specific topic that you want covered, leave it as a comment and I will get to it. So even though we can't dive into the nuance on a video like this, I think that having a general understanding of topics is still incredibly helpful. Because then when you are evaluating a specific person and a specific case, if you know the general concepts, you can better contextualize the fine details and place them into the picture. If you are leaving a comment about a specific topic you want covered or a specific question you want answered, I do recommend occasionally checking out my shorts feed or subscribing to see that pop up because I'll often respond to questions via a short form video. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something or you found something helpful or you just enjoyed it and I helped you to spend a little bit of time in a little bit of a productive way. Thank you and goodbye.